Hello everyone, thanks for listening and welcome to the second episode in this special series for Young Farmers, introducing you to Coon Farm Machinery. My name's Ben Eagle and today we're talking forage and specifically bale wrap, putting the focus on a key issue in the industry. For this, I'm really pleased to be joined today by Katie Calcutt, a product specialist at Coon, and Stuart Anthony, who is area sales manager at Berry BPI, who make the bale wrap we'll be talking about today. Welcome to you both. Thanks for coming on. Katie, can we start with you? Let's look at the basics behind forage production. What are you looking at when we're trying to improve forage quality in the first place? Um, and what are we trying to achieve? So yeah, the forage production is an entire process in itself. And a lot of machines can be involved in the whole process and sometimes multiple different operations as well. Uh, farmers, contractors and different people can get involved. The industry for quite a long time has been um, looking to achieve higher outputs, faster working speeds um, and overall like speed of operation. Uh, what we're seeing now is that we've kind of got to a certain point with that. Um, tractors are as big, well, they're, they're not as big as they can go, but you know, they're, they're pretty big these days. Um, and we've got um, lots of different harvesting equipment um, that can process um, a very, very high outputs. But now we're looking for a higher efficiency in what we do. We're looking at getting a better job out of what we've got from a sustainability side really um so this is where the um, improvement in forage quality really uh, starts to play an important part in the process not just looking at how much we can produce in an hour but we're looking at the quality we're getting from that forage so it's it's really exciting to break down the different steps of the of the process so from mowing tedding raking through to the baling wrapping and then the storage in order to look at how we can maximize the quality and, and do the best job possible really that's that's what everyone's looking to achieve and just talk us through that process for listeners who might not know um, tell us about the forage harvesting process um, so, yeah, so we're mainly talking about um, like grass forage here, but uh, I mean, there are obviously different different forages possible. Um, if you're looking at grass forage, then uh, we can be talking about silage, hay, haylage. Um, you know, they're all kind of variations of grass, essentially. And uh, we'd be looking to first mow the grass. So we we'll cut, cut the grass um, and then. In the UK, we often have um, challenging weather conditions. Um, so <laughs> that's uh, where, uh, compared to some other countries on the continent, we would then most likely use a tedder. Um, so a tedder, um, after cutting the grass, enables um, the grass to be sort of flicked out and sort of spread out and about and turned over a little bit. And that is um, important if we're looking to dry the forage. So silage is a uh, wetter forage, so we're not looking to dry that as much. Um, but if you're looking at hay, um, uh, then that is obviously just a drier um, baled forage. Um, and, and so that would need to be dried out a bit as much as possible by the sunlight. And um, then um, haylage is sort of somewhere in between. It's like a sort of wetter hay or a, or a drier silage. So um, tedding is really a key process um, in the for in the grass harvesting um, operation. But then you've had it in rows from the mower. You've then flicked it all out and got rid of all the rows. So then you basically need to row it back up. Um, and that is where the, the raking section of the operation comes in. Um, and there are different sort of um, rakes out there, which um, I'm sure we can touch on <laughs> in another um, podcast potentially. Um, but we, uh, in our range, are offering the traditional rotary rake, um, which is what pretty much everyone is used to. Um, and what's exciting as well is that we're seeing um, sort of belt merger rakes come through as well. So that's a really interesting topic, which uh, definitely fits in with what we're talking about now. Um, so you've got it back into rows and then finally we've got to um, harvest it um, and this can be done in uh, different ways. Forage harvester, uh, forage like box like a wagon that picks it straight up into a trailer um, or like some kind of, kind of baling equipment which again is what we're focusing on today um, and where my colleague Stuart comes in um, because in order to bale the forage you have to keep it <laughs> in a bale 
and uh, bale wrap is a good way to do that. So it's really a complete cycle. Um, if one of those operations doesn't go well, then it can have a knock on effect for the overall product that you produce. Um, and uh, Stuart will probably <laughs> explain people are storing these um, bales or whether it's sort of even clamp silage or anything like that over the winter period in order to feed their livestock. So it's really important that we do a great job so that we can get the maximum time um, for, for storing the product so um, the, the livestock have enough food over the winter. Katie, you, you talk about this a lot to lots of different people, but for listeners <clears throat> today, do you want to introduce the concept of film binding? Yes. Yeah, literally. I talk about, talk about this a lot. People will think that I just say the same thing over and over again, but I do talk about other things too uh, sometimes. <laughs> but it is great to be really passionate about a subject and um, it's it's great to be sort of on on the side of kind of introducing this with Kuhn into the UK market and really pushing it forward. So yeah. um, film binding is a great um concept it's a great new wrapping technology that we can offer um, as can many other manufacturers in the industry so what it is essentially is it's binding the bale with uh, plastic film instead of net so most people are used to net there are a lot of advantages to this so the first one is um with a with plastic binding you get a much tighter bale it's much more like shaped much more uniformly um this is because plastic has a lot more stretch in it compared to net net actually is quite forgiving um so when you bind a bale with net you know it encases the the round bale when you bind it with plastic you're able to put it through the pre-stretcher like you would on a wrapper when you're wrapping a bale of plastic um, and so because you're stretching the plastic it wants to go back to its original stretch so when it's encapsulated the bale uh, it basically squeezes the bale back in as it's trying to return to its original shape and this means that you're getting a much tighter bale but it's getting rid of a lot of air pockets and the clumps of the forage it's really compacting it down so silage works on anaerobic fermentation, so, but you basically don't want any oxygen in there. So the more air that you can squeeze out, um, this is how the silage forms when it's got no air. And this is the same principle if you're making clamp silage as well. You know, you pack it all down in the clamp um, and then you sort of like compact it with loaders or tractors or um, whatever you've got. And then you cover it in the plastic to keep it sealed away from the oxygen. It's, it's the same principle, just on a much smaller scale. There are other advantages, um, which are user friendliness is, is one of them. Um, it, it can be quite uh, annoying to have to, uh, like net to bind the bale and then you have plastic wrap to wrap the bale anyway. So you've got two different products. Um, that's a little bit annoying in terms of buying the products and storing them and having them with you on the baler and things like that. Um, but also if you're feeding out the bale, um, then when you cut off the plastic it sort of all comes off together the binding yeah. plastic and the wrapping plastic whereas most people are used to cutting the plastic off and then having it in the net um, and then having to unravel the net this can actually attribute to quite a lot of feed losses as well a lot of the forage can get caught in the net and then you end up sort of dragging half of it off with you um, and the final um well, not final point, but another point <laughs> is that, um, you know, sustainability is a really important topic um, and plastic gets a lot of bad press. Um, and the important thing to say about that is uh, we've got a lot better at recycling. Uh, I said we, I mean, like the world has got a lot better at recycling. So um, it's really important to look at the possibilities of recycling with the whole plastic process um, as opposed to traditional net. Net is a lot trickier to, to recycle, um, whereas plastic, um, we're able to sort of um, really put things in place to be able to reuse it. So it's, it's a great technology, like I say, and, um, and a lot of people are, are moving that way. Stuart, I want to bring you in here. Um, can you just give us a brief introduction to Berry BPI and, and what you do, first of all? Yeah, th thank you, Ben. Um, yeah, Berry BPI are one of the leading plastic manufacturers in the world. Um, we cover all aspects of plastic manufacture, industrial, agricultural is a big part, but only one section of it. We have a recycling division. We also make um, hard plastics would be tractor tank, diesel tanks on tractors, NHS products. We've done a lot of um, aprons and masks during the COVID pandemic. So anything to do with plastic we touch in our daily lives Berry probably had some part or you will be handling something which you're completely unaware of, but we would have manufactured. Um, Berry 
uh, British policy and industries, the BPI part of Berry has been going for 40 years. Um, Berry is sort of our, our, our mother company who um, give us that uh, worldwide aspect. But um, on the agricultural front alone, um, we export 56 countries, bail wrap around the world including the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere, which obviously gives us, we can do research and development in two seasons in one year. So and we innovation is our main thing. We consider ourselves to be the industry leader in bringing new products to the market, new technologies, very much as a machinery manufacturer like Kuhn would, but obviously ours is the plastic focus. Katie's given us an overview of, of the film binding system in, in general, but let's focus on, um focus on on the reasons why it actually um, aids quality of forage what's actually going on what is the plastic graph actually actually doing and what it's what is it preventing uh, the every link in the chain of the process we've started when you mow the grass is a very important link and obviously when we get to the end we've made our bales out in the field the plastic there is the protection and the maturing of the silage and the capability to keep it sound and safe for use over the next 12, 18 months for as and when the farmer and end user want it. That is why sometimes the process can be overlooked a little bit, but actually it is equally as important as any of the other links in the chain to do a good product, to do a good job. Um, we recommend that you wrap all round bales with six layers. Uh, I am aware that still there's quite a few people who still only use four layers. Four layers with a 25 micron bale wrap film will do the job and is, is uh, suitable, but the improvement of quality from four to six layers is where you see such a big difference in those two extra bindings, where it gives more protection, gives better oxygen, keeps more oxygen out of the bale. So this is where we're looking. Yes, it's a little bit more money, but it's all utilizing everything we've got out in the field, which is probably more and more important going forward, where we have to see to be more and more efficient and get everything we can out of every acre of land. And look at what costs, what ben what profit per acre we're making, rather than just it's a tump stack of bales in the corner of the field. Yeah, that's a really interesting point about layers. Um, how important is it to actually get that message out to end users um, of using that correct number of layers? Absolutely important. I, the, a lot of uh, contractors are using six layers now because it's peace of mind to them that they know that they've wrapped the, per, their, their, their customers' products, it's safe in the field, and then they don't have any phone calls in the winter saying, I have some mold on my bales or what have you, because um, the amount of layers and also the dry matter percentage is very, very important when wrapping bales. As a, my role as an advisor to end users and uh, people who are merchants who are selling it, is we do not recommend that you should be wrapping bales over 60% dry matter, because once you go into a lot higher dry matter, you have more white molds on the bales. Um, our philosophy is you should cut grass young, dry it out and rake it out and ted it out, but keep it young and dry rather than old and dry because a bale, it, it, everything you get out of a bale is what the quality you put in. So the world has become far more, well, is far more sustainability minded. Um, and one issue on people's lips right now um, might be um, sustainability when it comes to plastics. Um, there is a lot of pressure on reducing the amount of plastic that we use in the industry. Um, but this is why why this story really is so interesting because your plastic is recyclable Stuart isn't it and, and it ends up in a diverse number of different uses um, uses including garden furniture tell me about that yeah absolutely um, yes well Berry BPI have been had a manufacturer recycling division for over 25 years and annually we recycle 73,000 tonnes of uh, bale wrap now, obviously, it's not all our bale wrap. That's more than we produce, but we yeah. collect for everyone else as well. But this also includes horticultural films, silage sheets. So anything based in the agricultural, horticultural sector. sector. Um, we've got uh, three manufacturer recycling sites around the country, one in Dumfries, one in South Wales, and one at Heaner in Derbyshire. And... Um, it's it's a process where we, we have the we buy the wrap off various collecting agents and obviously we have to wash and clean it and then take all the debris out as you can imagine it is quite a it's quite a challenge yeah. um, and that is then turned into a polymer but obviously this would be a lower grade polymer it wouldn't be good enough to go into uh, bale wrap because it would obviously cause too many problems when you were wrapping but we we turn these into um uh, various products uh, a lot of it goes into um 
building materials for as we would say when you're underlaying in buildings and, and membranes for floors yeah. and obviously there we would pack that for your sort of um, high street DIY shops we would make that for those we also a lot of the product goes um, over to our factory to Heener in Derby where that is turned into um, bin bags and we actually the big green sack in Sainsbury's is actually made all made of recyclable uh, bale wrap okay and then finally, we also have a division up at Dumfries in Scotland where we make, we turn it uh, bale wrap plastic into, into timbers, for want of a better word, where we can construct garden furniture and benches and lamin pens and a whole range of products, which then get s- sent out. Because obviously we have to sell those because actually the recycling of the product is quite an expensive and laborious task, but obviously... It's a very important part of our business for completing the circle of, um, you know, enver- environmental awareness and social responsibility. Yeah. But um, and obviously it's a good job that parks and councils buy the bin- benches, which don't deteriorate. And so long term, it's it's re- recycling what what otherwise would just be a waste product and buried in the ground. Let's turn towards end users and perhaps some of the feedback that that you get from them. Um, Katie, can we start with you in terms of some of the advantages that, that they tell you about using this system? Um, the feedback that we get really is is the improvement in the quality of bales. Um, so that's in terms of the quality of the silage or the haylage in the bale, but also in terms of the bale shape. Um, so from a quality side, what can happen is that, um, you know, Possibly a contractor is doing a customer's bales, like a farmer's bales. Um, and obviously they look at this and they get a new machine with film binding technology on. And then uh, they ask the customer, you know, if they if they would like to change bales. And it can be a bit reluctant because, like you say, if it's, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So if customers are happy with their bales and their service from their contractor anyway, then why change? But what we tend what we tend to find and we sort of advise people to do as well is, you know, just just give try a couple of bales you know so do their regular contract and then try a couple maybe like 10 bales at the end with the film binding we know from experience the next year the customers come back and they're like we we, we want those bales um the quality they can see straight away um the bales are more palatable as well so they know the livestock are uh, they can see they finish those ones up as opposed to potentially leaving some on the floor. But something not to be underestimated as well is is importance of bale, uniform bale shape. OK, because this is really, really important when storing the bales. As Stuart said, you know, people can be storing these bales for like a year, 18 months, you know, even two years in some cases. Um, and so if the bales are not of uniform shape, then stacking can really, really be an issue. Um, and you know stacking is important because it, if you do a great stack obviously it protects the bales protect themselves from the elements a lot of stacking can be done outside you know not everyone has um, open sheds that they can stack bales in freely but you know if you start to get deterioration of the bales um, during the stacking process and if they're uneven shape then unfortunately the plastic can uh, tear you know in different places if they're, put, if they're at the bottom of the stack um, they can be put under a lot of pressure from the rest of the bales and this is where you start to have quality issues um, and we don't want those bales to go to waste so um, a lot of our feedback is based on sort of like uh, quality as well as perfect shape of the bales which makes them easier to store easier to handle and it all just comes back to the user friendliness of the operation for listeners who might be interested in seeing the system unless they happen to know a contractor who's using it is, is there any way that they can see it in action yeah, well, unfortunately, at the moment, you know, the pandemic is really sad because all my national shows and events have been cancelled for a second year. Um, and that is where, you know, we get get around and get out and see the end customers. Um, both myself and Stuart, we, we go around all these shows with our machines. So that is um, a shame. But hopefully next season we can resume and people can come and see these machines in action um, in person. Um, at the moment, uh, if you want some more information, then please just get on the on the Coon website um, there's plenty of information on there get in contact with us and uh, we you know we are still trying to run demonstrators um, you know sort of on a more local 
level um, keeping to the, the COVID guidelines so that we can still get these machines out there. There's plenty of information on the website um, and we have plenty of area sales managers and specialists in the field that are able to talk to end users and, and sort of like share our experience. And there are plenty of videos on YouTube as well. Um, so YouTube is such a great platform for seeing the machines working in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we heard from Sean in the last episode about the significant amounts of investment that goes into R&D at Kuhn and, and Stuart's told us about um, R&D at Berry as well. Um, as a product specialist, Katie, it, it must be really exciting um, seeing this R&D work through into the products uh, that you're presenting to customers, and not just your own products as well, but also um, like working with Stuart's um, with, with your own suppliers as well. Yeah, 100%. I um, am slightly biased. I am from an R&D background. <laughs> before, before working in Kuhn UK, I used to work at one of our factories in the prototype department. So R&D and development is something that really um, I'm really, really passionate about. And it's great um, coming from a factory environment um, and you're looking at it from one end. You don't always realise the impact the jobs that you're doing has on the future. Um, and it's great now to be back in the UK and see it from the sort of other end of it and be in the field with the machines and be giving the customers what they want you know we're so lucky that Kuhn at group put so much um, effort into R&D and so much resources into R&D um, we really like to try and move forward and, and as I said before push the boundaries in, in what technologies can be offered so it's amazing to be a part of it um, but it's also amazing to um, be involved in like the education of the different systems you know I don't it can be really difficult when people are looking at trying a new system or something new they've seen in like I don't know the Farmers Weekly or Profi or some of the big magazines a lot of people look to those publications to see what's coming through and and also the shows but it's great to be involved in the education of a concept I don't want customers to think that just because you work for a particular brand um, you're going to push that particular brand you know me and Stuart have been very much about uh, pushing the overall concept and why you would look at these different technologies and why it's important for what you're doing and yeah. and it's important to look at the overall picture of your operation and get down to some costings and get down to some sort of like the nitty gritty details to try and switch things up a bit so that's what we're really really about you know if, if people are listening to this podcast and they just take any bit of information away and and want to know a bit more then that's great then we've, we've done a good job haven't we Stuart, today <laughs> And just finally, as we're saying in all these episodes in this uh, Coon series, where do listeners go to find out more? I would say the best point of contact is to get onto our website and we can put you in contact with um, the relevant people. Berry BPI also have a website, but if you have any questions about wrapping products, you can always get in contact with either of us and we will point you in the correct direction. <laughs> Perfect. Well, that's all we have time for in this particular episode, but a huge thank you to Katie and Stuart uh, for joining me on behalf of YFC and Coon. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast and please do give it a share on your socials. Next time, we'll be looking at regenerative agriculture, but for now, it's goodbye from me and Katie and Stuart. This podcast was presented and produced by Ben Eagle for the National Federation of Young Farmers Clubs. It featured Katie Calcutt and Stuart Anthony and was supported by Kuhn Farm Machinery.